G'day everyone, we've got an absolute special video today with my boy D. Trump. So this video is going to be about how do we go from Donald Trump's genetic information to that fine specimen. So if we look at him, he's got some fantastic hair, he's got a beautiful point, all of that is thanks to his genome. But how does that work? How do we take that code of A's, T's, G's and C's and make that into some actual structures and functions within his body. Because every single living thing has DNA but not everything looks the same. So there must be something happening where we're converting that code into building things. And that's what today's video is going to be about which is about transcription and part two is going to be about translation. So a lot of this video is going to talk about things that you're expected to already know about and if you don't um, up in the corner you'll uh, see some videos that you should watch beforehand, so that's um, my video about what is DNA, what is RNA, and then what are genes and chromosomes. So basically transcription is the process of taking one of those genes and creating a copy of it. In lots of different examples and lots of videos you might see, we'll come up with some analogy to hopefully make uh, allow that to make sense. So for example, you might see grandma's famous recipe book, you know, we wouldn't want to lose that. So we make sure we, we keep a lot of care of that recipe book, but then if people want recipes, we just photocopy the certain sections and we send that out. Keep our recipe book, Nana's old recipe book intact, but um, we can have messages that we're not afraid to lose. Or we might have a production plant where we've got a head office giving out instructions and then around um, the manufacturing plant, different areas are responsible for manufacturing different things. And both of those analogies are fantastic because that's really what we've got here. So in eukaryotic cells, we have a cell and then we have a nucleus. And inside that nucleus is linear DNA. Okay. And in a human, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay. And, but in a um, prokaryotic cell, we just have a single circular chromosome. Okay, So in both of these cases it's the same process though. We have DNA, we have a sequence that we're interested in which we call a gene because that gene is responsible for creating a specific thing, in most cases a protein, ultimately a protein. But in transcription we're making a copy of that gene and then we're either going out into the cytoplasm to use it or we're already in the cytoplasm in the case of a bacterial cell where we're then going to read that message. We have the gene, we have a sequence on that gene, and then we'll have a little enzyme called RNA polymerase that runs along the DNA from three prime to five prime, reading that gene, and then matching up complementary bases to those A's, G's, C's, and T's. And so when that happens, we get a sequence that's complementary to our template strand and that message is then able to leave the nucleus to then be translated in the cytoplasm. So ultimately when we have this section of DNA, this gene, we can really create two sets of things. Most importantly we create this messenger RNA which is a complementary RNA molecule with a complementary sequence to our DNA molecule and it's complementary to our template or the same as our coding section of DNA, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but basically, we're creating this message, and then that message can be translated into a sequence of amino acids, which is a polypeptide or a protein. That protein will then go on to have a specific function. The other thing a gene could be transcribed into is non-coding RNA, and these are things like messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, um, or transfer RNA. Their function is really just within the manufacturing of translation machinery. So here's a list of some of the things that these proteins can ultimately do and become in your body. So we can have enzymes, hormones, channels and pumps in membranes, muscle contractions, antibodies, and involved in um, utilizing energy. Okay, So they're obviously extremely important and they really ultimately to all of um, the structural elements of an organism. So here in this picture, it's, it's quite a cool one. We're basically looking at um, the number of genes in the genome for different species. So for example, we've got rice, and you can see that this would represent a thousand genes. So how many times would fit that in that area there? That's how many genes it would have. 
you can see that the rice actually has more genes than a house mice, a house mouse. And um, pretty much the house mouse has a very similar number of genes um, to a human. And then you can see that in this case, we've broken those down into structure, transport, immunity, enzymes, and other. So you can see there are some of the categories I listed before. You can see slightly less in the roundworm, slightly less in the fruit fly, even less in yeast, less in bacteria, and then you can see this really small section here represents what we'd see in some viruses. And also mitochondria, remember they have their own DNA if you didn't know already, um, and that's how much they're gonna have as well. So I thought the best way um, to actually see this process is actually see this amazing um, video sequence. It's still an animation, but a, a sequence from DNA Interactive. And for the full video, go and check them out. I've just grabbed a little snippet to have a little look. Um, but I'll walk you through as it's playing. Okay, so here we have some what we call transcription factors. They sit at the start of the gene and then help control when that particular gene gets turned on and off. Because we don't want to be reading genes and creating a copy of that gene um, you know, every single second. We might only need that gene in certain scenarios. So basically, um, we'll have other genes switch on these transcription factors, which are proteins themselves, um, or but are part of RNA, and then they'll come and join um, to that section of DNA that we're ready um, to read. So you can see all these transcription factors all coming in, ready to start. It starts to coil over now. There's a blue section that's sort of within there, which is our RNA polymerase. And in about three, one, now, off it goes and you see it snaking along that length of DNA, um, creating this copy. And so as that RNA polymerase snakes along the DNA, you can see free nucleotides coming into the opening of the RNA polymerase. And inside that particular RNA polymerase, it's unzipping just a small section of that DNA and allowing um, free nucleotides to bind to their complementary nucleotide. And you can just see how fast it's going and how quickly it goes along that DNA, because this, an this animation is actually in real time. It's quite amazing. So in they go through that shoot, and then um, those free nucleotides matching up um, with the exposed nucleotides of the DNA molecule. So just remember, the DNA are deoxyribonucleic acids, so they're DNA nucleotides, but what's coming in that shoot is actually RNA, so um, ribose nucleic acids, um, and so one of the things that we have to remember is that when we match up an arginine in DNA, it matches up with thymine, but when we create that RNA copy, arginine actually matches up with uracil. So we'll stop the video there, and you can see it finishes, and then um, it's ready to snake away and leave the nucleus, if there is a nucleus, or stay straight out in the cytoplasm. Okay. So here you can see in the diagram what's happening. So we've got our RNA polymerase moving down our gene. It's unzipping and exposing free nucleotides. And then we're getting, um, sorry, exposing the bases of the DNA molecule. And then we have free nucleotides coming up and matching up with the exposed bases. So what would come next? We've got that G there. And we're gonna match that up with a C, G, C, C, U, U, because remember, uh, instead of thymine, we're replacing that with uracil, arginine, arginine, cytosine, cytosine, guanine, and so on, until it reaches the end of the gene, and then this, this RNA copy is then free to make its way out of the nucleus through these nuclear pores, okay? Now, you'll notice that there's two words here, sense strand and anti-sense strand. Sometimes these are called template and coding. Now, you'll notice that the RNA transcript sequence is the same as our coding sequence or our sense strand, except the T's are replaced with uracil. Okay? The reason why that's the case is because we didn't um, we didn't, the reason why that's the case is because we have matched up free nucleotides to the exposed um, bases on the template strand, not the coding strand. So on the template strand, we are now matching our C with a G. So this um, RNA transcript is actually complementary 
complementary to the template, which then makes it the same as the coding strand, which is what we're after. So when this RNA transcript leaves, we have now achieved transcription. There's one last thing that can occur predominantly in eukaryotic cells, and that's what we call post-transcription modification. And post-transcription modification is basically we have our transcript, we have our RNA molecule, but we actually decide that we want to actually chop that sequence up a little bit to make it different, which gives us a whole lot more flexibility, doesn't it? So if we've got a gene, but then we can decide that once we transcribe it that we can actually change it to, to create maybe some slightly different structures or functions, we now take you know, uh, our billion bases long and then we've basically got now infinite information almost. And new research is even showing that we can read DNA both forwards on say the template strand and then use the other strand reading it the other way as a template strand. So we, we're basically doubling the amount of information we can store in DNA, which is amazing. So basically uh, post-transcription modification is where uh, some enzymes come along and they chop out some sections of that RNA, messenger RNA, and then basically cut those pieces out, which are left out, and then the strand then rejoins together. And what's a little bit um, always surprised me is that the introns were the ones that were cut out. You know, for me, you know, you would expect that the introns are left in and the exons are what exit, but that's not the case. The introns are what are cut out and the exons are left because they are, are what is expressed. Okay, and so the EX part is from being expressed. So we say genes are expressed and then we see their functions. Okay, um, there's also these other little things that can occur where we put this five prime cap and this poly A tail and that just helps with the translation process. So just to recap, uh, before we get to that, so just to recap, I'll go back to this slide here. Um, we have a section of DNA. We use RNA, polymera RNA polymerase to unzip it a little bit, match free RNA nucleotides to the exposed template strand bases, creating a complementary sequence that we call messenger RNA, which can then exit out through the nuclear pore to be translated, which will be in the next video. Um, the other last little thing is that they're not always just forming messenger RNA. Sometimes as we transcribe a gene, we can use that to form rRNA, so ribosomal RNA, so RNA that produces ribosomes, or transfer RNA to use in carrying amino acids in the translation process, which we'll find out in the next video. So the question that I'll leave you with, what would be the messenger RNA molecule transcribed from the following segment of DNA. So answer that one in the comment section below or if you're in my class, um, put it on our Google Classroom and I look forward to hearing the discussion below. Thank you very much.